have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the ways. Onward, tears of the command. Church, are we on? Okay. Uh, what a great song to sing. Now, keep in mind, it, it is Jesus that saves. There's nothing that we can do. The Lord has given us two ordinances. One of them we practice regularly on the second Sunday, which is communion, the Lord's Supper, where we come before and remember what he has done for us. The next one is baptism. It's an act of identification with someone or some group, some message or some event. As a believer, uh, you are to do this one time only, all right, as an act of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. At Grace, we believe that baptism should be administered by immersion uh, to those who are truly believers in Jesus Christ. So what is baptism? Why do we do it? It has uh, two main reasons. You are now in Christ. This is a picture of our union with Christ and his death and burial and his resurrection. In Colossians 2.12 it says that we are, we are having, having been buried with him in baptism in which we were also raised with him through the faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And it's also a picture of washing away sins as we immerse Sarah in the water. Uh, it's a picture of her sins being washed away. Um, 
Ananias told Saul, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Is, ne is it necessary? No, the thief on the cross was not baptized, but he was saved. But yes, baptism is an act of obedience. It isn't necessary, but it is necessary for obedience. It's also necessary to let you, the church, the family that, that we belong to, know that she has been saved. So Sarah comes before us now uh, proclaiming her salvation. She goes public with it, as it says in Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So with this in mind, and also keeping in mind that Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For grace you are saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. With that in mind, Sarah, do you recognize that you are a sinner deserving the wrath of God? Yes. Do you recognize that your salvation depends completely on the person and work of Christ, what he has done on the cross? Yes. Are you now trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Yes. Do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his ways? And finally, is it your desire, by the help of the Holy Spirit, to live a life of obedience, pleasing to the Lord? Yes. With that in mind, and with her confession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Buried with Christ. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations, my baby. Praise God. What a great way to uh, start a worship service, uh, to see uh, visibly displayed uh, a picture of what God has done, and what Jesus promises to do, where he says, I will build my church, and we are commissioned, we're commanded to go out and to make disciples, and to, to see just that, and, uh, and what a great picture to see Clint get to baptize uh, his daughter Sarah there, so um, real quick before we uh, go through announcements, I want to pray for Sarah. So Father God, I thank you, Lord, so much for uh, the work that you have done in, in Sarah Horn, in her, in her heart, and her life, by uh, showing her her sin, her need for you, and giving her faith uh, so that she would trust in you and, uh, and submit her life to you and turn from her sins and follow you. Holy Spirit, would you guard her? Would you keep her? Uh, would you uh, help her to bear fruit, uh, to, to proclaim your goodness as she pursues obedience and holiness by your grace and as she proclaims you to her friends and those around her? Lord, would you uh, help us as her church family? to help her grow, to help encourage her and keep her accountable and, and love her uh, and spur on obedience in her and one another. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad you are here to join us as we worship God uh, together. I notice we got some empty seats and some uh, new people as well. I know we have quite a few who are home under the weather, so uh, please check in on your neighbor and make sure everyone is doing okay. And for those who are tuning in online uh, from home uh, with your tissues and uh, all that stuff, uh, please let us know how we can help you, uh, how we can uh, encourage and support you and, and bear you up there. Let's go through our announcements for the week. Actually, before that, if you are new here, in the pew back in front of you, there should be one of these little brochures. Please grab that, take it home. There's all sorts of information, uh, ways that you can contact us, the pastors or the deacons, or see what sort of services and, and things that we have to offer for you, how you can get connected and involved with us. Uh, and then as the men come around here in a moment to take up the offering, uh, all we would ask of you is on the back side of that is a little information card. Please fill that out, and, uh, tear it off, and put it in the, the plate, and we would love to have a record of your visit and get to know you if that's okay. Now our announcements uh, for the week. So 
uh, please uh, pay for family camp. We had an awesome time last week out at Camp Egan, getting to just fellowship with each other and hear some great teaching and uh, enjoy time together. So if you attended and if you have not paid, uh, we're not going to track you down. We're not going to send, you know, big burly guys to, uh, to come and collect. Just uh, put that payment in the church uh, lockbox as soon as you can, please. We would appreciate that. Uh, College and 20-somethings, our last Wednesday night, Ignite, will be this Wednesday. And so uh, please tell your friends about that. And then we'll have nothing next week during finals week. Uh, our Acts 1-8 team, which is our missions team, uh, they meet the first Tuesday of every month. So the next one will be on December 5th. Grace Kids and Youth uh, will be doing a Christmas lights and ice cream trip on December 13th. They'll be leaving the, in church vans at 6 p.m. here at Grace, going to Honor Heights in Muskogee, and then having some ice cream afterward. Uh, and then coming back around nine. So if you have a youth uh, kid, please let Will Peterson or Joe Schmidt know about that. Uh, there's also a youth progressive dinner on Saturday, December 16th. So let Joe Schmidt know if you'd like to help with one of those stops. Uh, the last Grace Kids of the semester is on December 20th. Um, and take note of our dates for our Christmas Eve and New Year's service. We have no Sunday school on those dates. Um, there's also uh, just something to keep in mind, and we'll talk more about it later on as it comes closer, but a once-a-month volunteer is needed uh, for the spring semester kids' ministry. So um, please let Christy know if you have questions about that. And last thing that is not in your bulletin, uh, tomorrow from 12.30 to 3 p.m., uh, we'll be decorating the church for the Christmas season. So it'll be a come and go if you can come for 30 minutes and help out or stay the whole time. Uh, whatever works for you and your schedule. But tomorrow from 12.30 p.m. to 3 p.m., we'll be doing just a, a help volunteer and decorate the church. So I think that's all. So with that, uh, have the guys come up for the offering, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your mercies that are new every morning. Thank you for the privilege we have to gather together to uh, worship you, the living, reigning God of the universe. Uh, to know that you uh, accept our songs and our prayers and our worship, not because of who we are, how good we've been this week, but only because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. Lord, would you enlarge our affections for you this morning? Would you help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, that you would be magnified and glorified the way that you deserve? Uh, Father, we ask that you would be pleased as we sing these songs to you, as we give of our tithes and our offerings, and as Brother Alex comes to, to give the message later, would you be blessed in that? And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, Let Your Kingdom Come.
Ransom from the fall. 
8:12 says, again Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life.
Well, this morning, we will be blessed to uh, have a brother in Christ share the Word of God with us. Alex Goulart will be coming. He is a missionary, in uh, he and his wife, Delta, in Paraguay. And uh, I'll let them, or let him, explain uh, their ministry and what they're doing. But let me open with uh, a few words of Scripture and then pray. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me pray for us as Alex comes up. Father, we love you. I thank you that we can love you because you first loved us. I thank you for Jesus Christ, the Lord, the King of kings, and our Savior. And it is him that we proclaim today. Thank you right now for a a faithful minister of your word. I pray that you would fill Alex with your spirit, because it is only by your spirit that anything good can take place today. And I pray that you would fill us with your spirit so that we may have ears to hear and hearts that can receive your truth And so, Father, would you sovereignly shine the light of the gospel into our hearts for your glory and our eternal joy in you. We love you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be here, and as you can notice, I have an accent. Uh, I didn't bring subtitles today, so you have to, you have to pay attention. <laughs> My name is Alex Goulart, and I want to start sharing a little bit of who we are and what we do, just for a few minutes, and then we go into the Word of God. Uh, and I will pray again before I uh, turn to the message, so... Um, now I want to share, this is my family, my wife is in the back, our kids are with the, uh, in their classes. Um, I, will, I will help you with geography, because I know it's a little bit complicated, confusing with countries. Uh, but we have four kids, and yeah, we have four kids, Ainoa, you have to remember the names. Ainoa, 12 years old, Bastian, 10, Etienne is 5 years old, and the little one, Einar, is one and a half. And... Yeah, next. And you can click a couple of times. My wife comes from Mexico, which is closer to the States, and I come from a small country called Uruguay. Um, just a couple more. That's a small country in the south of South America. And next one. This is where we serve, in Paraguay. So I'm from Uruguay, and we serve in Paraguay, which is a different country. You see, you need help with geography, I know, I, I know. <laughs> it's confusing, I know. But um, next one, we serve in, um, in the triple border, you can go on one more, where the three countries come together, Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina. So right there, next slide. This is a natural triple border where you can see the three countries coming together. Of course, the city is a little bit more here. Next one, please. This is uh, the city. You can see on the top the bridge that goes to Brazil. We live just a few blocks from Brazil. And among these two cities, uh, there are like 50,000 Muslims. And this is why we serve there. We serve and we share the gospel with everybody, but we are very intentional with the Muslim community. So next one. This is a picture of... uh, of uh, our city uh, Saturday morning. So if you want to retire in a quiet place, this is not an option. (laughs) Next one. And
the word of God. Amen. Dear God, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to be here, to be um, with your people, to be with your word, to exalt you, to sing uh, songs for you and to, to pray and to praise you and to encourage one another. We are here because of you. We are here because of your grace and we ask you that you use this time to um, exalt your son Jesus Christ and the gospel and his grace and that we can um, know the, your word better and deeper and that you can work in our hearts and encourage us and guide us and correcting us and yeah we are here to not just to learn intellectually about you but we want to know you personally we want to know you better and deeper so we leave this time in your hands so you can be exalted and we ask you that you help us to be listening to your word in jesus name amen amen I want to draw your attention to Matthew 9, 35 to 38, a very well-known passage. And the title of this sermon is Jesus the Compassionate Shepherd. So Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Matthew 9, 35 to 38 says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. This passage has commonly been used to speak of the needs for missionaries. It is preached that the need is great and the labors are few, that we should feel compassion for the lost. And while these are possible applications of the passage. I believe the central truth of the passage is much deeper. It is my desire that we can approach the passage in a proper, proper context, and we can see Jesus as the compassionate shepherd and the need for godly leaders to guide people to the good shepherd. In verse 35, Matthew shows us the ministry of Jesus. Jesus traveled to all the cities and villages. Jesus didn't have a specific location where people came to listen to him. He went to different places, teaching, proclaiming, and healing. But we find a very similar passage a little earlier in his ministry, in Matthew 4, 23, which says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Very similar to the passage that we have in Matthew 9. And this verse, in this passage, in chapter 4, leads us into the ministry of Jesus, teaching, preaching, and healing. We see Jesus teaching and proclaiming in chapters 5, 6, and 7, we have that, what we know as the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus taught about the Beatitudes, about the law, about anger, about adultery. He taught about divorce. He taught about loving our enemies. He taught about giving to the needy, about temptation, about fasting. He taught about wealth, anxiety, and judging. He taught us how to pray. He taught us to call God our Father. He taught us that the way is narrow and it is not enough to profess, Lord, Lord. He taught us that our faith will be known by our fruits. 
And we see Jesus healing in chapters 8 and 9. We see Jesus cleansing the leper, a leper, healing the sick, casting out demons, forgiving sins, calming the winds and the seas, giving sight to the blind, making the mute speak. We see Jesus healing a paralyzed or paralytic. And after all these teachings and miracles, remember we are chapter 5, 6, 7 with the teachings, 8 and 9 with these miracles. Matthew says about Jesus in chapter 9, verse 36. Seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is the compassionate shepherd. Jesus felt compassion for the people. And this phrase beautifully describes the heart of God in a beautiful way. It points out a very important aspect of Jesus' motivation behind his mission. When Jesus saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion. The compassion of God was the driving force behind our salvation. We can refer to Ephesians chapter 2, 1 to 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walk following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I love this passage. I love the following verses too, but I'm not preaching about Ephesians 2. But it's a, it's a great passage. We have the gospel and, and the glory of Christ and his grace. and It's a beautiful passage. We were deserving of God's wrath, but God... Thanks God for that two words. But God, in his mercy and compassion, chose to extend salvation to us believers. God did not save us because he saw something good in us. We naturally deserve his wrath, but he gave us compassion. Let me quote some people in history because we are standing over the shoulder of giants that were before us. John Calvin says, In our wretchedness we find the magnificence of God's compassion. He looks upon us not for our merits, but out of his own abundant mercy. Jonathan Edwards says, God's compassion is not a response to our virtue. It is the fountain from which a redemption springs. A bundless love poured out on underserving souls. And Charles Spurgeon says, Behold the grace of a compassionate God. Our sins deserve wrath, but His mercy has triumphed in Christ. We find the death of His compassion. And we were by nature children of Wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, the compassionate shepherd. And this is very different from the gospel that is preached today in most churches. In modern evangelism, man is the center of the gospel. There is no glory, no majesty, no power in the Christ that modern church is preaching. A Jesus who is a friend, but not Lord. Jesus is my homeboy. 
I see T-shirts, and I don't even understand what is a homeboy because I'm not from, you know, English is not my first language, so I don't even want to know. It just doesn't sound right. <laughs> In the old days, he was king of kings and lord of lords. Now he's my homeboy. I don't know what's that. <laughs> he's pictured as a desperate boyfriend for his girlfriend. He can't live without you. He's a gentleman who will always respect you. A genie in a lamp who exists to fulfill our wishes. Jesus wants you to be happy. Jesus wants you to have fun and enjoy yourself. And I can continue going deeper, but this is not the main focus of the passage. But just let me finish this with a quote from Buddy Bachman. He says, I despise the picture that is painted in our culture of this sissified, needy Jesus. He's just yearning for you. He's just longing for you. He wants friendship and relationship with you. He needs you. Oh, you are just breaking his heart. No, Woody Bachman says, he's going to break you. By definition, God is self-sustaining, self-sufficient, and self-existent. Therefore, by definition, he needs nothing. God does not need you, and he's going to prove it one day. And remember, we are speaking about Jesus in a context of compassion and mercy. He's a compassionate shepherd. He's a merciful God. He's a loving God. But it's according to his will according to his mercy, according to his love, not because of us. It's the in despise of us. What does it mean that Jesus felt compassion for the crowds who were like sheep without a shepherd? The Greek word, esplanisomai, literally means feeling that the bowels crave, feeling that the bowels yearn or crave. Jesus felt a strong desire from within. It could be translated as when he saw the crowd, his heart went out for them. He didn't just feel pity for the people. His heart was broken for the people. The Bible comment commentator Barclay had this to say about the verse 36. The word used for compassion is the strongest word for pity in the Greek language. It describes the compassion that moves a person from the depths of their being. This is what we see here in this passage. It's not just Jesus saying, oh, look at these poor people. They're not doing well. No, it's, it's so much deeper than that. And we can ask now, what did Jesus see that moved him so much? We see the compassion of Jesus when people are sick. We see the compassion of Jesus when people are hungry. We see the compassion of Jesus for people who need forgiveness. Jesus felt compassion because the people were like sheep without a shepherd. And this was an image to express the lack of godly leadership to guide, protect, and feed them spiritually. Shepherds refers to men who love the Lord and the Lord's people and lead the, lead the people towards God. False shepherds lead people to themselves and not to Jesus, the compassionate shepherd. And what is the condition of people who walk without a shepherd? And again, we have two different words in Greek, skulo and hripto. Skulo means to harass, to pester, to travel. Hripto means to cast, to throw, to scatter. Jesus saw the people of Israel were suffering harassment and were helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. People were harassed, pestered, troubled, cast, thrown, and scattered. And let me tell you, Jesus was not talking about the harassment of the Roman Empire. 
Jesus was not talking about the high taxes imposed by the Roman government. Jesus was talking about the lack of spiritual leadership of the religious leaders of the time. Jesus, the compassionate shepherd. We see that Jesus has compassion when people are without a shepherd. And Jesus' heart hurts when he sees the condition of people without a shepherd. Because Jesus knows the distress and helplessness of people. Jesus' heart goes out to people when they have no one to guide, protect, and instruct them. The question now is, do we feel like Jesus? This is one application of the passage. Do we feel like Jesus? What emotions arise when, we, when you see people who don't know Jesus, the compassionate shepherd? How do you feel about unreached people's groups that have never heard the gospel? Almost 3,000 languages don't have even one verse of the Bible translated. How does that make you feel? The role of a shepherd is to care, to care for, feed, and protect their sheep. Jesus was speaking about those who should be their shepherds, the religious leaders, scribes, and teachers of the law. In chapter 9, Jesus faced many accusations from the Pharisees. He was accused of blasphemy, Matthew 9.3. He was accused of low morals, Matthew 9.11. He was accused of impiety, Matthew 9.14. And he was accused of using the power of the devil. This is amazing. Matthew 9, 34. The religious leaders not only lack compassion for the people and fail to shepherd the people of Israel, but they also didn't allow them to know Jesus, the compassionate shepherd. The shepherds of Israel has abandoned their work, which is why the sheep were without a shepherd. The religious leaders of the time had no interest in protecting them, feeding or caring for people. They placed heavy burdens on the people so that they could beat their chest with pride. We are better than you. Look at you. So they create rules and after rules and more rules just to feel superior. The religious leaders closed the kingdom of heaven to the people. Neither did they enter, nor did they allow others to enter. This is why it ignites Christ's anger towards the scribes and Pharisees. And this is what awakes Jesus' compassion for the sheep without a shepherd. A few chapters later, we have Matthew 23, 13 to 15. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourself nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across Sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. But Jesus, that's not politically correct. You will offend people. Through chapter 9, we can see an emphasis on the confrontation with the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't want people to follow Jesus. There is a stark contrast between Jesus' attitude and the Pharisees' attitude. They wanted to separate themselves from the crowds unless they were the center of attention. They didn't love people. They only wanted to use people. 
The Pharisees had no compassion because they didn't know the source of all compassion. But God. Now, isn't this what is happening with the majority of pastors who only wants to become famous and rich in the name of Christ? It's not what we see in most of the churches. This is why we need to stand up and preach the gospel. But if we don't feel compassion for the people that are in these churches or the compassion, of pe- or compassion for people who are under false religions and cults, we will never preach the gospel with passion because we need compassion before. It's out of compassion that we can have a passion for Christ first and for people Matthew 9, 37, 38 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. This is a very interesting passage. Very interesting passage. After seeing this Crowds like sheep without a shepherd. And the condition of these sheep, he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. And he says this to his disciples. Verse 38, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his Harvest. The harvest, normally it was a negative illustration related to judgment. Jesus used this metaphor to refer to all who will believe. It refers to all those who would become part of God's people. And he said it's a very abundant harvest. It's plentiful We must pray to the Lord of the harvest to send labors. So verse 38 is a response to the Pharisees who were not leading the multitudes to the Messiah. The word in Greek is the same used for the expulsion of a demon from a possessed man. Meaning that to send someone to serve the Lord takes the same power as casting out a demon. In other words, it's easier to cast out a demon than to send somebody to work. Charles Spurgeon says, He did not say, The harvest is indeed great and the labors few, But that does not matter. God can bless the few and make them as many. Charles Spurgeon says, He believed in the all-powerfulness of his Father, but he also believed that the Lord would work by natural means and that many labors were needed to gather a plentiful harvest. Therefore, he told us to pray for them. Jesus the compassionate shepherd wants us to help through prayer and action. What a privilege, what a privilege, what an honor that he allows us to be part of his work. Jesus went to the towns preaching and healing, but he asked for more labors for the harvest. This happens just before Jesus sent out the 70 in next chapter, chapter 10. So if we just read one more verse, Matthew 10, verse 1, we found that he's sending his disciples into a mission. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirit to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. It will be a transition 
from his life and ministry to delegate. That ministry to his disciples. They will become the agents to continue his ministry on earth. After teaching his disciples, he gave them power and commissioned them. But now if we continue reading verses 5 and 6, Matthew 10, 5 and 6, you may say, well, this is just for the disciples. Matthew 10, 5, 6 says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instruct them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But after his death, burial, and resurrection, we have Matthew 28, 18-20, which we just heard before. Last words of Jesus. He says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Last words of Jesus. All authority, all nations, all commandments, all days, always. People need the compassionate shepherd. People need Jesus, the good shepherd. We must guide people to the compassionate shepherd. But we also must be compassionate like Jesus. Because people still today are like sheep without a shepherd. We must pray for more labors. This is a commandment from the Lord. We must pray for more labors. But we need to be ready to be workers in the harvest. We need to be ready to be the answer of Jesus' prayers and other disciples' prayers. We need to be ready to be workers in the harvest. We need to be ready to be sent out. We are the ones who have to point people to Jesus, the good shepherd. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We have a good shepherd. We have a compassionate shepherd. We just saw in the passage that he poured out his grace and his mercy to us. But God, now we know the source of compassion. Now we need to go out and be like Jesus, to feel compassion for the people, to point them to the good shepherd, to the compassionate shepherd, to point them to the gospel. We need to pray for labors, but we need to be ready as well to be the answer of that prayer. May the Lord help us and bless us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your mercy. How merciful you are. How merciful you are with us. How merciful, how, how much grace and love for us. Thank you. We continue recognizing that we don't deserve anything from you but your wrath. But we thank you for your compassion. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel. And we thank you that we can be part of what, what you are doing. And we want to be a light here in Tahlequah. We want to be a light in your state. And we want to be a light till the end of the earth. Because still today, people need a compassionate shepherd. So give us your compassion. Share your compassion so we can have a passion for your name and a passion for people. Continue working in our hearts. Bless this church. Help them to be a light in this community and to the end of the earth. In Jesus' name.
compassionate shepherd, we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand together.
Exactly what we need. We need that compassion. No, I do. I need his compassion to, to fill this frame. Um, let me, just a couple of things. Go ahead and have a seat. I'll close here in a second. Um, Alex and uh, his family, they've, they've changed because of some differences in philosophies of ministry. They have changed their mission agency. In doing that, they lost almost all of their support. He is fully funded by, by giving, by the church sending. And, uh, and so they are raising support. Uh, and I'll, I'll just tell you, for me personally, I honestly don't know of another missionary that I connect better with than what I've seen in, in Alex and his family. They understand the glory of God. They understand the heart of the Lord for the unreached areas of the world. Uh, his, his verse, as you'll see on the back of their prayer card, is, is what Paul said. So I, I, my, my ambition is to proclaim Christ where he's not named, where he is not known. You know, we need to go to our neighbors. We need to, there's lots of evangelism that needs to happen here. But there are entire people groups around the world, including where they are, that have no message of Jesus Christ in those places. And, and listen, folks, I don't know how many languages he speaks. I think there were three main languages in the city where he lives, and none of them are his native language, and he speaks all of them fluently, and English is also not one of those. And so I, don't, it's, it's, I think he's up to six or eight languages that he speaks well enough. I mean, you just heard, you know, again, what is this, like a sixth or seventh language, and he just preached us in English, and it was very understandable. 
this is a man that we, I think, need to be behind as a church, and I would encourage you to consider, prayerfully consider, uh, supporting him as an individual, and uh, you and your family sending him on their way. Um, we, are, we are called to every nation, and your calling is either to go, is to send, or is to pray. Uh, if you're not involved in one of those three and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're a disobedient follower of Jesus Christ. And, and going means going. It means getting the end. You know, some of you can't do that. I understand. And a lot of us need to stay behind to send. And what sending means is money. We've got, he's got to be able to live. He's got to be able to have a house there. He's got to be able to provide for his family. He's got to be able to eat. Um, you know, he's, they planted a church right there in the town where they live. They were called to a town 13 hours away, got a connection with somebody. That church is now established, and they just recently ordained those two pastors that they saw in there. They trained them up. They've got them equipped with the gospel, with, with faithful expositional teaching of the word, and now they're able to shepherd that church. And they're in the process of finalizing the training and the ordaining of two men in the other church that's meeting in the gas station. And so God is using them. And so the one church was 13 hours away. The other one was two hours away, the newest one. And that once he's able to establish that, he will back off and continue to go somewhere else to plant churches. And so this is, this is what we should be about as God's people. And I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider how God may use you in that. Uh, they are going to be back here in the foyer. They have a prayer list that you can sign up for. And I guess you'll get emails or something like that. And there's also their prayer card, so pick that up. And uh, if you get a chance to get to know Alex and Delta and the family, uh, you, you will find yourself very blessed in that. Uh, last thing before I read some scripture and close us is I'd like Sarah to come on up here, wherever she is. There she is. And Sarah, we're going to give you a Bible, and we want to, again, congratulate you on receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We love you, and thank you for for your boldness in, in getting in front of us and proclaiming your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Before you leave, come on up and, and shake her hand and uh, welcome her as a sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, let me end with this. Sorry, Sarah, make you stand up here for a second. Again, <clears throat> their verse that they have in their card, Paul says, I make it my ambition to proclaim the gospel, not where Christ was already named so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no declaration of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. And here's, here's the beauty of that, is our job is just to send and to go and to pray and be faithful, and God does the work. He will save a people for his name. There will not be a crowd lacking before the throne from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people on this planet one day, and Christ will receive the glory that is due his name. We see that so clearly in the book of Revelation. Behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And we scoot on down. And they sang a song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and purchased for God. Not might purchase for God, but in his death, he purchased for God a people with your blood from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God and they will reign upon the earth. And then a little bit further down, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then one more down, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. That is set in stone. The Lord has said it, and it will happen. So when I close out right now and I say you are sent, I genuinely mean that. You are sent. Mm -hmm.